we're going. Bam. Here we are. Good morning, Joe. Welcome to the morning show. How are you? I am still pulling it together. I was up till about four o'clock last night editing video. Uh, this one was just a little mountain bike video. I kind of have a mountain bike channel as a recreational side gig when I'm not running an ATV and a side-by-side -side channel. So I do that one just for fun. Uh, who knows what we'll about it. But I was up editing till about four, getting a mountain bike project done on a 20-year-old full suspension mountain bike for people that are into that. So, so cool. That you'll never so you'll never guess the channel name. Mount, mountain Bike On Demand. There you go. Wow, so there you go, man. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that. But um, let me do a little bit of housekeeping here and let's roll this thing. So, uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining us here on The Morning Show. We need to thank GBC Tires for always being there for us and supporting us. Also, they support the industry with the finest off-road tires you can get for your ATV or UTV. And, hey, I haven't got a pair on my tr truck. So uh, if you're looking for a great set of tires, hit up GBC. They're really going to uh, take good care of you. For the finest ride, Elka Suspension is always there for you. They're leading the industry in every category that you can imagine. Uh, they just won the Baja 250 as well as the Co uh, Camp Coker race. Sorry about the delay there in, uh, I believe it's South Carolina. They're, uh, those guys are awesome. They just make some amazing products and they have great support staff as well so if you're looking for for shocks those are the guys you want to talk to so joe a lot of things happened in the last couple of days in sporting that uh doesn't always affect the atv industry but um you know bryce and neil kept it perfect you know in, in uh, uh camp coker um chloe harper won and we've had three new people on the podium in the pro four by four class that I, to my knowledge, I don't think any of them have ever been on there. And the West coast rider, Kyle gross comes and wins another XC two class round just after he won in Havasu a week ago. Uh, speaking of Havasu, the pro woman's champion out there has kept it perfect. She is almost got two complete seasons where she's unbeaten. Well, if you go back and look at, uh, the first year of the women's pro class, she only lost one round then. So that, that woman is dominating on the West Coast. <clears throat> uh, and you and a bunch of other media guys got to go and tour the factory for Yamaha. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot to unpack. Where do we start? Um, you know, Bryce and Neil winning pro and GNCC. It's not surprising. Um, I don't root against anybody winning. Uh, it's more entertaining when, you know, people are battling back and forth to the win, like Supercross has been lately, which is unusual but cool. Um, so we'd like to see some more of that. Um, well, who did it, we're going to branch up onto Supercross a bit. The only two guys that have won in the last six rounds is Cooper Webb and Jet Lawrence. That's that's true. That that is true. But it hasn't been just yet. But right. So, fortunately, fortunately, Mother Nature keeps uh, giving them rain to deal with, which is shaking things up. I think if it was just dry tracks every round this year, it would have just been nothing but the jet show. Uh, but no, Mother Nature has thrown some wrenches in his plan, and it's keeping that sport competitive. But Chloe Harper winning. That's, that's exciting. You know, I, the first time I ever saw her, she was on your show and, and I, I remember calling you like, who's this girl? You know, where did, what does she race? What, cha what champion is she? Oh, she's, a, she's not a champion yet. Oh, wow. You wouldn't know by the way she carries herself. 
So, uh, you know, very, she seems very dialed in on, on her sponsorships on how to represent herself. So, you know, it's, ex it's exciting to see her get a win. I've watched her go on Facebook after the last two or three rounds, she goes live and does a little race report on how her day goes and just represents. So good for her. That's exciting. Well, she's a student of uh, Adam McGill's. And, you know, if you see his social media platform, it's phenomenal. He's got listeners from all over the world and in multiple dif different categories. I mean, some of them aren't even fans of, you know, re re regular ATV racing. They may just be fans of Adam McGill because he's a dynamic personality and uh, he's always got something funny to say. And, and he's out there just he just put himself out there and his sponsors love him for it. And I hope that he stays around another two or three, maybe four years because he still hasn't got to the age bracket where he needs to retire. He got a top five yesterday, right? Yes, sir. He got fifth. Well, there you go. So as long as you can still keep doing top fives, you're still competitive. Keep yeah, going. You got, you got Josh Merritt got third and uh, John Galata Jr. Got uh, fourth at least fourth or sixth. Maybe, maybe Adam McGill's going to try to race until there's no more Honda parts left. That's a possibility. Well, he did say that he was a Honda man till the end. <laughs> you know, Hey, uh, gross. I talked to him and had a deep conversation. They have a deep stack of Honda parts as well. And um, he doesn't seem to, to want to get off the Honda either. So there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, they just won a Honda, just won the San Felipe 250. Well, every machine entered was a Honda 450R. So um, that uh, that says a lot for the Honda. Just wish that the factory would listen, but they're not going to. Um, they're not. Well, I, I've been dying for two weeks to hear what it was like in the Yamaha factory. The photos and the videos don't do it justice, I guarantee it. What, what was it like there? I mean, it's, it's big, it's, it's sprawling. They, they do a lot more to put the bikes together here than, than you'd think, you know, the engines come from Japan. Uh, hopefully I get all this right. Or I'll get a call from the blue mafia, but the, the motors come in pretty much done from Japan, but pretty much the rest of the bike gets built here. Um, so there's a lot of construction that actually takes place in Noonan, Georgia. Uh, they build they built the YFZ and the Raptor, and then and they built a lot of other vehicles there too. They're you know they're uh, wave runners side by sides. They they do a lot, a lot of vehicle construction down there, and you know it's cool you know that most of the construction is being done by Americans for a sport that's a, you know it's a really an American sport. Yeah, they race quads in Europe, but. We've always been the hotbed for it, so it, it's cool that Yamaha's doing it here, and you have American people involved, and everybody there seemed to uh, to have a good time. You know, we did we did a factory tour. Um, I don't know how, how how much to tell you about the assembly line. I mean, it's uh, but they had a bunch of racers there. Johnny Gallagher was there. Um, Oh boy, here I go. I'll start naming names and start forgetting people. Um, there. Oh, Bill Balance was there. Johnny Gallagher was there. Walker Fowler was there. Uh, Jessica Elioff was there. Say her name, last name fast so you don't mispronounce it. And then she beats me up. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Corey Ellis was there. And, you know, it was, it was cool. So they did an autograph signing and a ton of people from the factory came and got autograph posters and I was surprised, you know, how many people showed up for autographs. It was cool. Their line stayed busy for the hour or so that they did it. And, and, uh, no, a lot of, a lot of passion for it. You know, Yamaha, everybody says every year they're going away the next year. You know, I, I, I don't think they're going to quit anytime soon. And, and I don't think they will until the government snuffs them out. I think they still have a lot of passion for the sport. Um, I shot a lot of interviews with um, – I got some sound bites from the racers, you know, talked to the product planning manager, Travis Hollins, from back when they built the bike. 
Uh, Pat Bielsi, who's their product testing manager, um, you know, he he does a lot of ATV and side by side testing, and will happily tell you or anybody else that you know the sport quads are his favorite segment to test. He enjoys them the most. You know, those guys they still have a lot of passion for the sport, and uh, and it really shows in you know the fact that they had us all down there to to show it off for the 20th anniversary of the YFZ 450, and you know that. It's cool because you look back and that bike's really changed the sport. You know, Yamaha didn't abandon us in the 90s when, you know, the quad racer disappeared in 92. Obviously, those who know the history of the sport, maybe for those that didn't, you know, the TRX 250R Honda went away in 89. It was a three-year machine. Uh, The Banshee lived on through the 90s, but it wasn't. It just wasn't a motocross bike. It wasn't a cross country bike. Great dune bike, uh, great desert bike. If you set it up right, obviously, you know, we know it's an endurance race bike. You guys won so many uh, Pont de Vue endurance races over in France with it, but it, it just wasn't the right handling package to win you know the races here in the states as far as cross-country motocross but you know they still gave us a high performance machine and they gave us the blaster which was one of the greatest beginner level sport atvs ever built you know right up there with uh the the 200x is is one of the best budget sport machines ever built you know they gave us the warrior which was like the big bore comfy couch for the time you know it's it kind of was for the 80s and 90s what the Raptors been for the 2000s. The Raptor 700 only, you know, the Raptor 700 is so good. Um, it's hard, <laughs> hard to compare the two because the Raptor 2, 700 is so good. But, you know, Yamaha has been there for this sport through thick and thin with more offerings than anybody. Um, it's I don't want to say I'm a Yamaha fanboy, but... I'm a Yamaha fanboy. You know, if we do a shootout in any other segment, Yamaha's in it. No, they're not getting any preferential treatment. But, you know, I I own a Raptor 700, and I hope to own two Raptor 700s. So there you go. Yeah, it was, it was a great event, though. And hopefully we'll see more stuff coming from Yamaha in the future. There's no chatter about it, no discussion. Um, you know, Yamaha wants to see another player in the game. They they say it. They wish they had some competition out there right now. It would give them a reason to push. But as it is, they sell every – this is a funny stat, and Jeff Henson at Dirt Wheels told me, um, you know, we like side-by-sides, but we're sport quad guys at the core, and we we kind of are laughing like, yeah, look – Honda doesn't want to build side by sides because you know nobody nobody wants sport quads. It's like, yeah, look at look at you and every other side by side manufacturer discounting your side by sides two, three, thirty five hundred dollars off. Yamaha sells every sport quad they build at retail. They're not discounting anything, but that's just because there's no demand for sport quads. So, right, that, that answers the question right there. You know, I wish that we had a decent uh, sport, a secondary sport quad to compete with them, because where could the technology go? I was talking to somebody about this uh, weeks ago or days ago, and, um, and and they asked about the level of our ATVs. Could you imagine where the level of three wheelers and four wheelers would be if we wouldn't have had 60 minutes in, in 2020? If they oh, wouldn't have been just like like you know uh, the demon plague, the technology and the suspension and the engines and all of the things would have advanced as they did in motorcycles and some of the machines that we would have nowadays. I mean, yes, the aftermarket people are awesome, but the factories always give us a platform that's a notch above. Well, you know it's. It's you need that progression from the factories for the aftermarket because, you know, how far can you take a bike? You know, the YFZ 450R, 
you know, you can, you can just keep adding compression and more lift and, you know, grinding away on ports and it, how far can you go? You know, you can build it till you build it into a grenade, but at the end of the day, to progress, you've got to have a new platform with more inherent capability built into it. And, you know, until Yamaha does an update or somebody else comes in with something better and then gives Yamaha a reason to push, you know, I think I think we've sort of plateaued. You can only make it go so fast and hold together. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a dream, and that's what we need. And, you know, obviously, that's sort of why we're doing what we're doing with Raptor right now. Um, we're going to... We're going to try to do a couple cross country races this year on a Raptor, do one in a pretty stock form, um, almost bone stock. We're just going to armor it up, throw a kill switch on it. We're going to go run a GNCC. Fingers crossed that we can make that happen. Um, hopefully I didn't, I don't stick my foot in my mouth. And then we're going to go back at the end of the summer um, with a money pile bike, throw a whole bunch of parts at it and see how we can do. You know, it's, we can't sit around and wait for another bike to hit the market so we're going to see we're going to see how many spots we can slide that raptor into and maybe start looking at it as a race bike um something different something that isn't really being done hasn't been done much and uh and then obviously there's the news that dirt wheel dropped last week on just that first look article on that ko which i don't know if we're ready to go to that yet or not but you know, um, I think it's going to be a while till we see another 450 hit the market, but we might see another beginner bike pretty soon. And maybe we can get that Raptor out there doing some competition, just break it the monotony up, get some different kind of machines out there. Well, yeah, if you ch if you take that, what is that, 11 year old to uh, and correct me on the ages, if you would. What are you got a, a 11 year old to 14 year old, 15 year old kids going to ride that bike? The, the Which KO? The KO? You know, and this is where this is where it's kind of like the communists versus the enthusiasts. Um, you know, the race promoters, and, and I might get this age wrong too. Um, maybe somebody's watching that would, that would know for sure, but you know, uh, in motocross and right now more in cross country you've got you've got classes that are laying i'm guessing starting at like 13 race raptor 250s um i know in, in the gnc series for a while they had a 13 to 14 12 to 14 class that was like 300 and under and then they had schoolboy senior that was schoolboy junior then they had a schoolboy senior class that would let them run 400s i think at like age 14 and 15 so you got the racer side and then you've got the government side, which is, you know, if it goes over 35 miles an hour and whatever, it's for 16 and up. So it, that bike would be sold as a 16 and up bike, but people will inevitably race it at a younger age because it makes sense. Right. Not waiting for it, but you know, what you do with your child is your business. So within reason. Well, is there a, there's no reason for there to be an age bracket limit on there. I don't believe uh, because you, they didn't, they don't put the ages on the motorcycles. You know, you can put your uh, seven year old on a four fifty and turn him loose and, and nobody says anything. And it, it's I think well, I mean, I don't think you, I don't think so. I don't think you could go to a local motocross track and sign your seven year old up for the 450 class. I don't know that that's accurate, but I mean, being a little facetious, but you know what I'm saying. But you do have like schoolboy junior class, you know, and, and back in the day, I don't know what that means in modern two wheel motocross because I don't follow the local scene as much as I used to. But, you know, schoolboy junior, you used to be 12 and you could ride a 125. Well, a 125 was just as tall as a 252 stroke. And I have a feeling that at age 12 or 13, you can probably race a 250F now. And those make as much horsepower as the 252 strokes used to make. So, yeah, I mean, within reason, your your, your point's valid. You know, 
you can you can put a kid on a two fifty F, <laughs> sit him, put him on there, send him out racing, and he can't even touch the ground. So right. So so my point. I didn't mean to get off on a on a political chant like that. I was more wanting to just talk about the, the age bracket, you know, for bringing this machine into a cross country series, a motocross series, and a work series where the Raptor. 250 has dominated some of these classes because it's all there is. And if we bring this 300 in, you know, the guys are running 300 EXs against Raptor 250s. Now, if we bring this fuel injected 300 KO in, I think it makes more horsepower than both of those stock, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, let's let's rewind um, for those who aren't hip to what we're talking about. Um, Dirt Wheels a couple of years ago tested a ko jackal 200 it's a little 200 carbureted air-cooled um two valve single overhead cam engine very very basic uh supposedly it's based off the crf 230 engine obviously it's been border stroke down to a 200 we we reviewed that bike about six months ago uh, at the time that we got our bike for review we requested it you know, I, I let them know at the time that I ordered the bike. It's like, I want to review your 200, but it's not really the bike I'm after. I am I want to review your 300. I want to review the one that's in Europe, the one that you don't bring over here because we've got a gaping hole in the U.S. market for that type of machine. Like we used to have, and I mean, I went through it and we used to have the 300EX. We had the Raptor 250. Um, about the time that we wrapped up our test of the 200, um, they got a new uh, PR guy, media relations guy over at KO who kind of took, took the load off the original gentleman we were dealing with over there. And he kind of took that position on as his sole gig. And so KO, you know, we've had a lot of discussions as far as like Honda don't care, Kawasaki don't care, Suzuki don't care. They say that the numbers aren't there and 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 it's just not worth their time. And KO starts looking at the numbers and they're like, Yeah, that looks pretty interesting to us. You know, because when you're when you're a small manufacturer like them. You know, you're fighting an uphill battle. You know, if you're not from Japan or North America, you know, it's kind of like you're typically you're it was hard. It's hard to gain a foothold. Um, you know, they they sell dirt bikes. They sell ATVs. Um, everything that they sell ATV at this point in the country is 200 or under. They have a 300 two wheel drive utility coming. And then they obviously have that A300 over in Europe. They're the quad that we're talking about. You know, they, but they have, they have dirt bikes. They have a 252 stroke. They have a 250 kind of higher performance four stroke with KYB suspension. You know, that's the same brand of shocks that Yamaha uses on their dirt bikes that people love. Whether or not it's the same forks, I don't know, but they're KYB forks. They're using name brand suspension components. Um, you know, but I think companies like them, uh, and probably GPX, uh, the you know, Pitster Pro, you're trying to gain you're trying to gain a foothold in a market that's extremely competitive of dirt bikes. You know, there are now ten if you count Ducati and Beta and and these guys, there's like ten companies, uh, tier one companies, and I say tier one as far as what they're gonna charge for their vehicle for pricing. You know, you're entering a segment that has 10 competitors. Uh, dirt bikes are overinflated like ATVs were in 2008. Um, but and so when you come in and you're a new player and you're not one of those big companies with that big reputation for winning MotoGP on the, you know, like Ducati or being big in trials like Beta and, and Enduro and things like that, you know, it's, how do you gain a foothold? So you're selling your dirt bikes, you know, like KO, they're selling their dirt bikes at what a five-year-old Japanese bike costs. Well, a lot of people would rather just go buy a five-year-old Japanese bike because it was like, well, I know what a Honda is. I can trust it. I can get parts for it. I don't know this KO brand. So 
I'm not as willing to take a chance. So these smaller companies, you know, they're sort of bringing things into the United States to test the market. Like, I wonder if this dirt bike will sell. You know, this was this is one of the first times where they've had an industry reach out to them, you know, and, and I guess I sort of started that conversation where it's like, hey, you have something in Europe that if that motor is reliable, because, you know, go watch videos of the A300. I know you have, but if, you know, people who are listening, go look up KO A300 on YouTube and watch the videos of it. Like, it sounds like it revs well. It sounds like it builds RPMs well. It looks low and stable and planted. Um, there's videos of guys out there sending some decent little doubles on them. Um, and like I told them, you know, if you if your engine and chassis are a decent platform, then the U.S. market really needs that bike. You know, there's a and and if you can bring it in. You have no competitor. It's not like you're going into the dirt bike segment that's super saturated and, and has a ton of used bikes on the market. You're going right into the entry-level sport quad segment where the Raptor 250 and 300EX have traditionally been. Um, the Honda's old. Nobody thinks of it anymore. They're still good bikes, um, but you just don't see them out there as much racing you know all the kids are on raptor 250s the raptor 250s like the trx 250r of kids racing they're getting older parts are getting harder to find um it doesn't enjoy the aftermarket support that the, that the trx 250r enjoys so when the parts are hard to find you know i don't think anyone's building transmissions for them in the aftermarket that i know of um so ko is kind of getting the picture that they have a unique opportunity to step into a niche that has no competition. And, and it sounds like they're interested. Um, once I started talking to them um, about the 300, I, you know, I, I, me and Jeff, the dirt wheels, we've become really good buds over the past year. And it's like, dude, we got to team up. We got to, we got to pull, we got to try to make this happen. We at least got to find out, is this bike uh, is this bike have the potential to step up and be that Raptor 250 replacement 300x replacement for you know 16 year olds that want to go work a summer job and save up enough money to buy a four wheeler not just get their parents to co-sign for a four wheeler you know can this be a machine that your 13 to 15 year olds can go out there and race cross country on and they can buy it and their parents can help them build it up and you know it it'll be far far less expensive than building a hybrid hopefully so you know if that machine has potential we hope we get to find out um so one of the things that's going to be the the uh catalyst for that is part supply if they can get motor parts into the, if they're going to supply motor parts, you know, pistons, cranks, transmission components, uh, I think that people will flock to that machine in in the cross country works environment. Uh, your motocross environment, maybe, uh, especially on your local level, because uh, the local level may not be as saturated with hybrids. Um, I don't know the classes well enough off the top of my head because I haven't researched it for a motocross race where um you're not going to race that 300 against a hybrid which is not fair because they're not they're not the same world you know and, and who knows um the promoters are smart enough to still maintain some sort of production rules for the big bikes to keep the yfz 450 you know, relevant and competitive. And, and I don't know if they went to full hybrid rules, maybe the YFZ 450R would still be relevant and competitive because it's it's still going to be less expensive to buy one and build one, especially at a lower level. But, you know, that's not the point. The point is, is if they're willing to kind of leave a production rule for the YFZ 450R because there's a bike in the market, you know, 
who knows, maybe they would create some sort of a 300 production class again that this thing could run in. And if you had it, you know, you could build an old 300 EX for it, or you could build a Raptor 250 for it still if you wanted to. But, you know, like you said, you know, right now, I don't think that there's a real class in motocross at the Nationals for a production-based small mid-bore machine. Uh, I think it is all hybrid-based at this point. Could be wrong. Um, that's what I've been told. So I think the glaring the glaring place for that bike is cross-country works. Uh, local racers, like you were saying, you know, kids that just – want a bike they can go get started in um you where were hmm? what were you saying hey, joe i'm here i'm sorry I, I missed what you said it froze us both for there a second um but uh what I was what I was asking, we were talking about the part supply, and then we were you were also talking about the rules that the promoters were going to put out to make sure to keep that machine in a class that's going to allow it to be competitive, where I think your works and your cross country are going to do a better job than your motocross uh, environments will because go ahead. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't know how long it it was frozen when we were talking, but yeah, I think I think cross country work series. I think those are the series where that bike could step in. If, if again, if it's got a decent, reliable engine, decent, reliable chassis, we haven't seen one yet. Um, but yeah, if it's got potential, I think those are the I think those are the disciplines where it immediately would have impact. And then I think it would next potentially be adopted by motocross if the promoters would create some sort of a production class for it, where then you could also race an old 300EX or a Raptor 250. Right, right. Well, we'll have to watch how this plays out and see. You know, it's just like with the Raptor 700. We're just going to have to watch the industry and see how they're going to, to do it. Um, I'm also in the chat here um uh, square one speed channel um and i are talking a little bit here uh um so we think that people are going to buy it but the, you know the skeptic it, the skeptics are going to are are going to be the ones that uh are going to have to be won over i i know that there was a little internet segment that you had or a or a text string that you had going on because somebody was mocking the fact that it was made in China and see who cares it, who cares where it's made is what I'm was where I'm going with my point. As long as we get something that's quality and that is going to provide an opening for these riders that are being left behind by our industry. That's all I care about. A hundred percent. And, and, to cover some ground to kind of get people to where we are now really quickly. Um, you know, once, once I became aware of that thing was having conversations with KO about the possibility of bringing that bike into the country. You know, I started talking to Jeff at dirt wheels and he's a big sport quad advocate. So, um, where, where we're kind of at is we, there's now a couple of the two hundreds we tested floating around the country. You know, fuel customs has one Rossier has one. Um, well, I'm sorry, Rossier and fuel customs are kind of sharing one, uh, Chris Borning at DBR. He has one. He just built skid plates, nerf bars for the 200 Rossier is doing a pipe. Fuel customs is going to do an intake. Um, that 200 on the West coast is supposed to head up to Nolene and he's going to develop some aftermarket shocks for it. And it's just so people who buy that little 200 can get some stuff to go out and turn it into a good, viable little trail bike for, you know, that, that young rider. It's a 16 and up bike, but hey, what you do with your kids is your business, not mine. Um, you know, to, to build it into a good trail bike for that, for that young up and coming rider. But 
it's more so to also prove out to KO that like the U.S. aftermarket will support your company, especially if you bring in a bike that has race potential, we'll build parts for it. So the U.S. aftermarket is actually proactively proving that out to this company through the 200 to entice them to bring in the 300. I mean, it's like I've told KO, like, the, the U.S. aftermarket is putting their money where their mouth is. They're enticing you to bring that bike in. They're, do they want to sell parts for the 200? Absolutely. If, got, if you got a KO Jackal 200, we'll be doing a, a full build on ours to show you everything that has come out for it. Um, but it's to prove out to the company that the 300, if it's viable, it's going to have immediate aftermarket support. Um, dirt wheels, what they have done is... Jeff over there kind of found all the specs he could find from Europe, a bunch of pictures. And, you know, he just nerded out on all the information that he could get on that bike to say like, Hey, you know, here's what we know about, you know, engine displacement, horsepower. I mean, that bike supposedly puts out 27, 28 horsepower in stock condition. That's the same horsepower as stock 400 EX. It's a 300. Um, a water cooled double overhead cam fuel injected four valve 300. So, you know, it looks like it has potential. So, Dirt Wheels dropped an article uh, in their magazine. It came out like last week. They put it on the internet this week. Last Monday, they put a thing on their website about it, and it was amazing. And, and I'll tell you what, the major manufacturers should be getting scared. Um, scared if they care about keeping their, their old school core buyers, because what was most amazing, like, yeah, you had a couple people that ran their mouth and said some stupid stuff and put their foot in their mouth. And I have a feeling one or two of them probably regret it because they look dumb, but overwhelmingly the response was extremely positive. Like, if this is what it takes to get sport quads going again, so be it. Hey, that thing looks like it probably really has some potential. I hope they bring it in the country. You know, 90, 95% of the response was, if you know, hopefully this will show those other companies that we're still here and we still care. It's like Honda, your brand loyalty, when it comes to the people who are, who, like sport quads who still like sport quads that used to like your brand it's ending it's ending like i think and it, and it got me excited it's like okay people are waking up they abandoned you and now the people are abandoning them it's like no we don't want to ride your dirt bikes if we did you built some great dirt bikes we'd probably be happy to ride them um it's like no we we don't want to go finance a $25,000 side by side we want a sport quad you won't build it. The show must go on. Who's going to do it for us? So I think the consumer is ready to see somebody else step up. And that's great. I think 10 years ago, had Dirt Wheels done that story and put that on the internet, it would have been 95% Chinese junk. But the attitude has changed. Times have changed. And, and people... People are ready for something different. So that's that's very exciting. Will we see one in the country? I don't know yet. Um, if I were a betting man, I'd say there's a good chance. But time only time will tell. We're gonna keep we're gonna keep pushing KO and hopefully something comes of it. Well, you just brought up a good point. Something that I'm hearing in the customer base that I talk to every day is they're pushing their side-by-sides aside or getting rid of them and buying ATVs again because the family wants to ride and they don't want to ride in the, in the car. So your, your group of people that were buying a side-by-side, a four-seater and riding their kids are, are now looking for ATVs because their children want to ride ATVs and not all of them are wanting to ride motorcycles. You have a fair amount that that are going to the dirt bikes as well, but the ATV industry, from my perspective, is actually growing because there are more and more people that want to play um, on that envi- on that platform uh, out in the sand dunes. Um, y- your two stroke ATVs are still super powerful as far as 
the, the amount of product that people want, um, it, it, it's, it's not dying. If the factories would provide a machine, people would buy it, you know, just like in the chat here, they're talking about, you know, if the bike proves itself on the social media platforms with the tests, and then the general consumer starts to have good luck with it, people are going to buy, they're, they're going to buy everything they make because it's a new machine and their children need a bike to ride so that they can go to the sand dunes. They can go to the trails, uh, that, that park, that, that riding area that you were advertising a few shows back on your shirt, you know, uh, people want to go do these things and they're not, they're being held back because they can't find machines that the whole family can ride. So it, it's tough. You know, and, <clears throat> It, it's, you know, we live in a society where children sit on the couch. You know, when when I was growing up in the 80s, showing my age here, you know, we had video games and we liked them and we had a lot of fun with them. But video games are something that we did when it was raining, when it was just too cold and you had to take a break from being outside so you didn't get frostbite. But other than that, you know, it's let's build snow forts, uh, go build, you know, plywood and concrete block ramps on the front sidewalk in front of the house, give grandma a heart attack and send it with no helmets. You know, we were out being rough and getting tough and, and hardening ourselves today. These little soy boys just sit on the couch, you know, Sorry, not sorry, but, you know, you throw a child in the back of a four seat side by side. Like, yeah, if you're up in the front seat, if you're driving it, it's fun. It, they're a lot of fun. They're cool. I mean, come on, man. When you when you come on, man, when you throw your kids in the back seat and they're just sitting back there bouncing around all day long, can't see over the seat in front of them. I mean, how fun is that? I'm sorry. How fun is that? You know, I'm sure. Before long, you just got the kid in the back with his cell phone or his tablet out going, where's where's the USB port so my battery doesn't die on this tablet? You know, because well, you're yeah, just the guy, the speed like, one, uh, square one speed channel just said, you know, people don't want to be passengers. They want to freaking they, they want to have either the steering wheel in their hands or the handlebars. Why do we want to sit around and 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 be a passenger when we can ride and, and be part of it. Um, side by sides always felt dangerous to me. <laughs> Called false confidence. That's too funny in the chat. Uh, I, I'm that guy because I get behind the steering wheel of a side by side and it's going on its side or on its lid because, you know, I almost feel indestructible and, and side by sides do not react like ATVs do. And, that's my problem trying to so, set it the turn or set it up into the whoops the same way I would my ATV. And it, it doesn't work like that. Well, there's nothing you can do from the driver's seat to, to counterweight or counterbalance that machine, you know, um, it balancing two careers here, you know, one is it one's being an ATV editor. The other is being a side-by-side -side editor, you know, I like side by sides. I think they're a ton of fun. Um, I think they're especially fun if you can actually afford them um, and you're not overextending yourself to get them, but they're most fun for the driver. And if you're in the back seat, I think they're way less fun, especially if you're a kid. And, you know, there's just, you know, it, to me, side by sides are kind of more like drag racing. You know, you go out, you drag race, you're like, yeah, I won. Well, what'd you win? You spent more money than the guy next to you to have a more capable machine. You know, we were talking, I was talking 400 EX yesterday. <clears throat> oh boy, who 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 was it with? I'm having a brain fart. But we were talking about back in the early, early, early 90s, back in the late 90s, um, one of the top pro guys from the time, was it Chad Duvall? Is that who it was? Um, Lobo 250Rs that I remember. It might have been, I think it was Chad Duvall was a name that I heard, is rode a 400EX at one point and went out and waxed a bunch of 250Rs on 
Evan Hartzell was telling me about it. My buddy Evan, who I'm going to go shoot with later today, he was telling me. I think it was Chad Duvall said early not late '90s, early 2000s, showing up on a 400EX with stock A arms and some and some non reservoir work shocks and beat most of the guys on a 400EX. You know, um, the point be, point being is that here's a guy who has a less powerful machine than the other guys out there. And he's waxing a bunch of them simply through ability. You know, there's there's a lot of satisfaction of riding an ATV of when you conquer a hill. It wasn't just the machine. You didn't just sit in there and hold the steering wheel and push the gas button. Like, no, your body weight was in the right place. You made the correct athletic moves on that bike to make that happen. I mean, you're 50% of the machine on an ATV. So, you know, the exercise the feeling of accomplishment when you clear that jump or you, or you clear the top of that hill, you know? Yeah. You, you, you bought, you bought a lot of that talent in a side by side, but what you do on a sport quad, you did it yourself. So it, to me, that's, that's, that's the fun part of it. You know? And I think that's a lot, that's a reason a lot of these guys that go get into side by sides are starting to go back to sport quads you know, Jeff, Jeff from Dirt Wheels has a Honda Talon sitting there in his garage that he's talking about selling because he's just like, if this thing ever breaks, I don't want to pay to fix it. Well, guess what he just picked up yesterday? YFZ 450R. YFZ 450R. He went and did a track day. I caught him last night. He's like, man, thought I was talking to a 14-year-old kid. He's like, man, it was so fun. We went out there. I got there at 9 a.m. and we just left. We were out there all day. I turned so many laps. I didn't wad it up one time. It was so good. It was so much fun. You know, there's another guy. You know, the head guy at Dirt Wheels is thinking about selling his side by side because he just got himself a new sport quad. So and, and he has some physical issues that can make riding an ATV difficult for him. And he still loves it so much that he wants to, to ride again. And, you, you know, I've been getting some treatments and uh, I'm itching to go and see how my arm's going to hold up after the, uh, I got some use back uh, through the treatments that I'm going through. And um, some of the neck problems I was having and everything are, are better. So, hey, let's go see how much better I am and put it through the paces and get out there and go riding again. So I can't uh, I can't wait. Um, so Twisted Lizard um, just opened up in uh, in Blythe um, for quads and trikes. So that's uh, it's um, it's an hour east of Blythe. Excuse me. So. so see there are places that are starting to come back that are allowing more and more ATVs because I think the ATV community was suppressed by the UTVs so much that they're it's it's going to spring back and you're going to see a, a a bigger abundance of people wanting machines that they can go ride so it's a perfect time for KO to jump in there and steal that market away uh, I don't think they'll take Yamaha's portion because, you know, Yamaha is too strong. And I'll bet they could start producing a warrior again within just a couple months uh, and add to their uh, formidable sport quad, you know, thing that they already have with the, the 700, the 450. And then if they did a if they did a warrior and a, and a Raptor 250 again, wow, how much happier would our industry be? I own the I own the I've taken a lot of grief for owning that machine from uh from friends in the industry. Like, why'd you buy a warrior? Like because that was a 50 and the EX was a 300 and I was fat, so I thought I needed it. Well, it's it's not they're not a bad machine. No, they're not gonna go out, you're not gonna go out and and set the world on fire. But if you're an enthusiast and you want to go ride, um we did a story years back on the Raptor 350, which is basically a warrior, warrior, just a little zoomy zoom to it. And, uh, you know, with a pipe and a carb and air filter kit and 
uh, we did some other stuff to it. I can't even remember everything. And uh, we were out at a, a motocross track uh, up there off the five. Why I can't think of the name. I'll never, I mean, it's old age here. Sorry. But right off the five, we went up there to this motocross track and we were having so much fun because I could ride it as hard as I wanted and it would just go and keep running. And it was sound and did everything that we wanted it to do for that show. I just couldn't do this tabletop because it just didn't have enough power to get over. Or I was just too fat. Who knows? I had a, uh, I had a fun on my warrior, but you know, it's, I think that unless Yamaha were actually working on it now, you know, and they're just being very tight lipped about it, which I don't think is happening. Um, you know, you're talking, you're talking three to five years for them to bring a bike to market. It, they don't, they don't do it in two years, like some companies in the industry. Um, you know, the Japanese, it's a three to five year process to bring something to market. So, you know, if, if KO were to jump in, I think they could enjoy the limelight for a significant little period of time and, and get a little market shared. You know, I can tell you now we're already, we've sent them a small list of uh, updates that we'd like to see the 200 receive. And, you know, there's been then part of the conversation has been like, how good is what you have and how willing is the company to pivot to make the improvements in production that the U.S. market's going to demand to have this viewed as a, as a really good, high quality machine. And I can tell you the guys in the U.S. are definitely receptive. Um, so, you know, I'd love, I, hopefully they'll, they can do something, get it in the market and and have a little run with it. Um, you know, Yamaha, Yamaha needs KO to do this bike, which doesn't make sense, but it, it makes perfect sense. It's like, what do you do with those riders that are going in between, you know, Raptor 110 and YFZ 450R? Like, what is there? Well, you've got a couple T14 bikes. You got the Can-Am DS250. Um, which is a T14 bike. They pretty much get that T14 certification by having a top speed limit. I think it's 35. Don't quote me on it. Um, but that's one of the key things that there's that the Phoenix 200, uh, there, you know, the Honda 250X, that's a 16 and up bike. Uh, I think the KO could come in and eclipse all of those and, and, and have a good run and, give kids something to ride young adults something to ride until they're ready to step up and buy that 450 or that 700 and, and have the money to buy that 450 or that 700 could you imagine what the industry would be like if the rumors were true back in the 2008 ish era that suzuki was putting out an ltr 250 i never heard that rumor I did. Me, me, and my buddy Nick Lalani. You know that was part of what kept me up till four o'clock last night. He's a he's a pro flat tracker on the West Coast. He does some circle track races, trying to get a series started out there next year, uh, a little four or five race series to just get some more racing going on the West Coast. But you know, he we were talking last night. And he's like, "How come nobody has done like a a true two fifty performance bike?" And I and and I said, there's just, there's not a place for it. And, you know, he's like, oh, I think there is, you know, my wife and this, and that, and the other. And I'm just like, it maybe if the 450s were the displacement that they should have been, there'd be a place for another bike. And I told him, like, I think the 400 class is kind of that next step down. And he's like, it's too close to, to the 450s. And, and I just, you know, I'm just saying, that, well, the simple economics of it are the problem, um, because you're not talking about your daddy's 250X motor that's got DNA to that 350X motor, which is a piece of cast iron that you can just throw it off a cliff, stick a stick of dynamite in it. You can't kill it. You know, it's not an indestructible kind of motor like that 350X was. 
you know, these are high revving, low torque, titanium, lightweight parts built to rev to 14,000 RPMs. 450 probably wasn't big enough for the ATV race segment. I was glad Mike Walsh came on here and said it, you know, a couple months back. Um, they were probably never should have been 450s. They probably should have been five or 600s for race quads. We got pigeonholed into that dirt bike number. Um, I, I think a 250 is not enough because 95% of these sport quads that are sold are never raced. Now you're putting a high revving, highly, highly volatile 254 stroke that needs constant oil changes, constant valve adjustment. You think you're revving your 450, you'll be revving the piss out of that 250, and you've got to stay on top of it. And if you don't, it's going to grenade. So why why even make that thing? It, and, you know, I, Yeah, would I like to see it as a race enthusiast? Sure. But as a practical guy who wants to see the sports segment go – I don't think there's a place for a high performance 250 in production ATVs, not with not with a race motor. If Honda wants to use their CRF 250 air cooled fuel injected dirt bike motor, maybe that's a motor. Um, something a little heavier, a little less RPM. I, why can't we have? Why can't we have the same lineup that you know KTM's got a gazillion bikes? Why can't we have the same lineup in ATVs where you have your recreational 250 and your race 250? Um well I believe I believe that you're going to sell I if the if the ATV industry truly wanted to grow this is this is where my opinion is you know shoot me down or not if you have more options not just by Yamaha, but by multiples where you can get a 250 recreational machine. Then you have a 250 race bike machine and you're same with your 450s. Just like if you look at some of the dirt bikes that Honda put out and KTM's put out, you know, you have a dual sport machine, you have a, a race machine and you can do multiple things with each machine and it gives the individual user an option. So you detune that race 250 and let's say you keep it more of the racy style motor, but you detune it um, by changing the cam, uh, take some compression out of it, uh, put a different kind of pipe on it, you know, increase the stator so that it'll carry more lights. And that's more of your recreational bike. It's a narrower A arm with a lower grade shock. Doesn't mean that you can't adapt the other parts to it. And okay. make more performance, but you're you're given two options for the same bike. I didn't mean to step on you. No, no, I'm, I don't mean to step on you. But you're there's a lot to unpack, and, and we can get through it pretty quickly. Number one, there's no red sticker segment for ATVs. Um, your motocross dirt bikes, your four, you know, KTM 450SX, Yamaha YZ450, uh, you know, the motocross version. Those are red sticker bikes. They're not EPA compliant. They don't meet emission standards. There is no red sticker segment for sport mm -hmm. ATVs. We didn't so, vote in categories, so why can't we vote them out and allow, allow us to ride these machines, you know, and do something about it so that we can have them? <laughs> That's a good dream, but we can't even get enough people to vote to close the border, and we have 12 million people just came across the border, and we had 10,000 Americans die last year from fentanyl overdoses while our government doesn't defend the border. But when Ukraine uses gas on, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, when Libya uses gas on their people, we launch $100 million worth of cruise missiles at them. I don't know. We can't even vote to get our government to protect the country. Um, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. So, I'm, so number was, one. We don't have a red sticker classification in ATVs. So there gets rid of that portion of having different bikes. Then moving into the displacement, looking at what Mike Walsh said that I've always felt and I completely agree with, a 450cc sport ATV is not really that ideal spot. It's not big enough. You know, and here's here's why I say it. You know, we're 
we're building YFZ 450 R's to 60 horsepower engines. I'm sure somebody's claiming 70 at this point, who knows what pipe dream they're selling, but we're building these 450s into 60 horsepower, 65 horsepower, whatever the real limit is, um, hand grenades that don't hold together. Meanwhile, in the two wheel segment, your 60 horsepower 450s, let's go back 15 years. We got rid of 500 two strokes because they made 60 horsepower. We determined back in 1990, back in 2004, 2005, when they got rid of the 500s, it's like these things are just too big and powerful. The 252 stroke is all the average guy needs. 500s went away. Fast forward to 2024. You got one or two 454 strokes that are cracking 60 horsepower. Now they have better suspension. They have better geometry. The horsepower is a little more linear, but still now we're at the, we're at that point where two strokes were too fast. And you hear so many guys that are in the dirt bike segment saying the 450 is too much. Um, you have so many guys, like if I were in the market for a dirt bike, I'm not buying a 450. What do I need a 450 for? You know, when you've got top pro guys saying, I don't really race this bike. I just hang on to it for the race. Um, what's the average consumer need that for? What is too much motor in a dirt bike for the average guy up to the pro level? Too much motor just so happens is not too much motor in a vehicle that weighs 200 pounds more, an ATV, has twice the rubber on the ground because the tires are wider. We got pigeonholed into 450. I don't think 450 is big enough. So then why do you come with a 250 that's obviously not even close to being big enough? Um, there's not the numbers in youth racing to warrant that. Like, let's look at this KO 300. If, if KO's only market for that 300 were going to be cross country racers, motocross racers, desert racers, I'll be the first one to tell them don't import it. You're not going to sell enough. You but, know, but, but I think that your, your off road industry people not just the sand dune people, but the desert riders as well, because there's a whole aspect of 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 non dune related desert riders or other terrain riders that are looking to bring their children in. This is a great discussion, actually, that that they need a machine that's in between that we don't have. We've already talked about this. Let's exclude racing. Let's just talk about your enthusiasts and what they need. Um, do they need a 500 cc sport quad you know in between the 700 and the 450 or do we make the 700 more racy and, and, and you know give them a, a better platform for rolling out into the trails M maybe but if you bring a 250 version or a 300 version sport atv that can go to the to the trails to the desert and give them more options. Uh, I don't see what the problem is there. I understand your red sticker, green sticker, you know, the, the, the licensing of this stuff, but I was looking at it at an, as an aspect of to grow your enthusiast portion of your sport. I wasn't thinking racing. I was thinking enthusiast. Uh, you've lost so many young people because they get to a point on their ATV that there's nothing for them. And then they go to dirt bikes and they you never know, come back. Or and, yeah. Never come older. and I think, I think, sure. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying there's not a place for an engine displacement below a 450. Cause I absolutely think that there needs to be, that's why we're working on this KO 300. I mean, that's why it sucks that Raptor 250 went away. It's why it sucks that the Honda 300 EX went away. I mean, Honda could bring that 300 EX back with a new look and fuel injection, and it would be relevant next year. Um, I think the only problem is the, and, and you know, you're a motor builder and, and I'm, I'm down to be corrected, but 
when you hit the gas on a 300EX or an old school 250X um, or a Raptor 250, the power is right there, right off idle. You don't have to rev for it. You don't have to ring it out. You know, you can't take a YFZ450 motor and which is a cami feeling engine. They're jittery off the bottom. They don't like to growl around like a 400EX, like a Z400, like a Raptor 700. They don't inherently have that good, smooth, off idle torque pull, you know? And I've asked a lot of motor guys, is there anything I can do for my YFZ450 to get to get it to give me tractor like power like a 400 or a raptor 700 and the answer is consistently no like you're not going to get a yfz 450 to pull like a you know a bike that has a boring stroke oh, where it's the motor bigger. design isn't designed for that so trying to get it to do that is is ludicrous in my opinion uh, right. you can them to where I, you can fool around and have a good time on them but that's you know that's really not what they're for um your 700 is really not um a tool around machine but it it will do it because it's such a you know you can put it third gear and chuck, 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 chuck. um even though the motor doesn't isn't really designed for that either um your but older cooler style four strokes were um okay could you build that yeah, we could. We have the ability to build all of that. In the chat, they were saying that the 700 needs a competitor as well as the 450 uh, in the in the open displacement. Yeah, I agree. You could build this another straight axle, um, 650 to 700 cc sport ATV. But we're losing sight of the age bracket that I'm trying to hit. I'm trying to hit those those youth riders that aren't over 16 and that are in, you know, just above 10, 11 years old, maybe 12 years old, we need to support them. We need to fix this problem to grow our sport. And yes, all these other issues need to be taken care of as well. But I, I believe this 300 KO could bring a whole new age of riders even the 200 KO can bring a whole new age of riders that we haven't seen because we haven't supported them. We haven't helped them along in teaching. So that, that, that was where I was going with my point. Maybe I just expressed it the improper way. So, and I, and I think the point I'm really just trying to make is like, yeah, we absolutely need something in that 300 CC category for your 16 and up, you know, Younger guys that can, you know, it's easier for mom, dad to buy the bike or them to work a summer job, buy the bike. The only thing where I'm kind of pumping the brakes is like, what motor do we start with? You know, like that KO 300, that motor looks a lot like the KLX 300 engine. Okay. The KLX 300 is not a super high rever. It's not revving to 14 grand like the KX 250F engine is. Um, it makes its horsepower at a little bit lower RPMs. It's going to hold together together better. Um, I just think if you if you can't take a 450 and make it run like a big stroker motor, well, you're going to have a hard time taking a 250 motocross motor that's inherently built to be volatile, temperamental, a little thoroughbred motor, you're going to have a hard time turning that into a tame, torquey, recreational motor. You know, well, I think to that I, I, I want to disagree a little bit because the style of cam, the compression that you give it, um, how you formulate the exhaust with the intake, you can help it along. Yes, it's still going to be a little forever it's still going to have some of the characteristics that you explained but but there's a way to do it and they did it with the 450 x model in the honda um and made it a chuggier trail bike you know to where you could ride it on a single track environment um so i, I think it's it, it's doable to a point i well, understand well, i understand 
Yeah, when, yeah. You're, when you're talking 450X Honda, again, you're talking 450. You're talking about an engine that is regarded as having more power at that displacement than the average person can use. Whereas if you take a 250 race motor that was developed initially, and yeah, you can you can calm it down and you can put different valves in it, you know, but you're inherently taking a motor like the life of a 250 motocross dirt bike motor is significantly less than a 450 motocross dirt bike motor. Yeah. Now yes. you're taking that motor and you're dropping it into a machine that weighs 200 pounds more and has twice the rolling resistance and already costs a lot of money to stay up on in a dirt bike. And now you're putting much more demand on that motor. I just, I don't know if motocross motor is the way to start. I know that's everybody's dream for ATVs is why can't we have high performance two fifties? Because you're not going to want to pay that bill. You're not, yeah, you know, you gotta rebuild nobody wants to run good enough gas. Nobody wants to run a clean air filter all the time. I know you have this discussion every day. Um, 250 motocross motor is not your daddy's XR 250. It's not. It will never last as long, no matter what you do to it. Nope. Nope. Um, we need to shout out uh, Mini Bike Madman and MX Beans and Square One Speed Channel for participating so well in the chat and, you know, bringing some of the ideas in my head and getting me uh, on track. So I want to thank those guys so much for, for their input. Um, Joe, as always, brother, we Ian can square I was right. gonna just Ian over at the Square One Speed Channel. He's uh he's looking to maybe do some raptor builds for the desert, which I'm kind of interested in keeping up with and hearing more about and seeing how that goes. Well, hey, reach out because I love that idea. I think that uh the uh Raptor 700 should take over the desert in the racing world. Um, and in some other versions of it as well, because that uh, that machine, the platform is awesome. But Joe, you, you and I could could do this all day long, and we've eclipsed our time schedule um, as usual, which we always do. Um, I want to thank you so much, Joe Tall, for bringing your insights to us. Uh, you always raise the bar for me and make me think outside my box, and I appreciate that so much. Hey, man, I'm glad to be on here. I have no idea what time it is, but I'm going to go shoot a 400EX project today. So I'm heading out to the woods with a crispy rebuilt Honda 400EX. And uh, we're, we're going to find out we're going to find out what you can buy for $3,000. Awesome. I can't wait. We'll, we'll be talking to you. Uh Square One said that they're going to reach out. That's great. I can't. I can't wait. Um, thanks, guys. Let's have a great Sunday and enjoy your family, Joe. Enjoy your shoot, and we'll be back next Sunday to talk more. Happy Sunday! Thanks for having me. All right, brother. We'll talk to you later. See ya. Bye bye.